also Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to you dads out there, and happy Juneteenth tomorrow, and welcome to St. David's, both in person and virtually on Zoom and Facebook. I'm Anjanette Lasavich, and 2023 around here is our year of connection. So before we start, please take a moment to introduce yourself and wish a happy Sunday to someone near you. And if you can, choose someone you don't know. <laughs> it was a busy day around here yesterday when we held our first ever Metro Detroit Peace March. Dozens of people from all over the metro area joined us for a rally and march, including Southfield Police Chief Elvin Barron and Mayor Ken Seiber. We also dedicated a new outdoor educational exhibit called Swords into Plowshares, that you can view on your way out of church today. Also, thanks to the generosity of our friends at Kroger, we now have a refrigerator slash freezer for our St. David's food pantry. As you may know, we've been stuffing our freezer and fridge in the parish hall with donated items from Starbucks, Whole Foods, Panera, and other donors. And we just don't have the room. So Kroger has come to the rescue with this refrigerator, shown off by our food pantry manager, Andrew Carey, which is now located in an adjacent storage room and out of the kitchen altogether. So thank you, Kroger, for that donation. Later in the service, we'll be honoring our choir, and a reminder, if you're joining us on Zoom, welcome. We are so glad you're here. You can find this morning's bulletin by following the link in the chat box. And if you would like to submit a prayer request, please do it via the chat box. Let's now ready our hearts for worship with our prelude. Thanks for joining us this morning.
if you like, it's not mandatory, but um, I hear that more people get something out of the children's sermon than the adult sermon, so I'm kind of open to doing this. Are you guys going on vacation this summer? Not that you know of. Do you have a favorite place you like to go on vacation? Can you name your last vacation? <laughs> you went to Florida. Wow, that's a pretty good vacation. You went to Chicago. That's a good vacation, too. Uh, you know, one year I went on vacation and I went to a small town, and in this town, which was very old, uh, kind of in, 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 close to the middle of the town, they had this huge rock wall. It's huge. It was years and years ago. And on the other side, they had the lake. And this was actually a dam that was built in order for the town to be built. This was the idea is that these uh, town fathers had planned to build this town, but they, of course, needed a way to keep the lake from coming in, right? And so as our guy was, you know, explaining all this stuff to us, we looked at that wall, and that wall, as they said, was really old, and it had these rocks that was made out of rocks from like the field, and some were little, some were big, some were round, some were kind of rectangular looking, and they were massive amount, all of these rocks, making this wall that holds this massive amount of water from coming into the, the town. And so I asked our guy, I said, you know, what happens if, if one of those rocks pops out? There's all of those devastating. One of those rocks pops out, and then the water will rush through, probably one or two, or one, two, three, four, before you go to the town, will be flooded. It's like, wow, just for, just even one, one tiny rock, you know, each one of them is really, really important to keep that water out there. Well, today we're going to hear in the gospel. We're going to hear how Jesus called 12 disciples to go out and to spread the word of God and to heal people and to cast out demons and to do the work that God wants them to do. And of course, we're Jesus' disciples too. We're probably not called to do exactly what they did, but we're all called anyway. And many of us think, you know what? I'm just a little rock in this big old world. What good can I do? But in order to be part of the plan that God has, it's kind of like being part of the plan that they wall that those city planners have in order for that town to thrive and for, for God's will to be done to require all of us. So I don't feel like me, but sometimes you wake up and you're like, I'm just this little person. Nobody would know if I'm not here. Does my life really matter? And I think God really wants us to do that. It's like that rock wall. Every single stone in that wall, no matter how small or how big, is really important. I think you guys can put two and two together. Please stand for our time. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the Hebrew Scriptures and the first book of the Torah called Genesis. Here we learn about how God called Abram to bring God's blessings to the world. The Lord appeared to Abraham in the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves on the tree. Let me bring you a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour needed and made cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. And then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. They said to him, 
where is your wife Sarah? And he said, there in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah did not say, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh yes, you did laugh. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son, whom Sarah bore him. And Abraham circumcised his son um, Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. May the word live in us. And bear much fruit to your glory.
Our second lesson is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, who reminds us that our present sufferings produce endurance and subsequently hope. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. May your word live in us. And bear much fruit to your glory. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, 
James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, no or two tunics or sandals or staff, for laborers deserve their food. Where, whatever town or village you enter, find out who is, in the, is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will, welcome, will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet and leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel, before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Wonderful to see you all this morning. Thank you so much for coming. Gosh, on Father's Day, you get to say, I'm just going to sleep in. <laughs> and here you are. Thank you so much for coming and making our community so much more because you are here. You know, I want to start out with a story about a friend of mine. You know, in college, I was in a fraternity, and I had a fraternity brother, and his name was Dwayne Six. Dwayne Six. He was an upperclassman. I was a freshman. And he was constantly chewing tobacco. And he had a last name that was a number, Dwayne the Six. How cool was that? Well, as we know, in college, we, we, we have a time of searching for ourselves when we go off for those four years. We look for mentors. We try on new things. We try on new hats. We're in search of our true identities, which is often done on a trial and error basis. This is what was going on when I came home for Christmas break with a bag of beech nut chewing tobacco. I'm very thankful to my parents who let me chew in the house, for my girlfriend's parents for not raising a ruckus, and for giving me the space to figure out eventually on my own that chewing tobacco was not really for me. I think they were also thankful that they were not around at that decisive moment for me when I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I kicked over the very full spittoon. It was in my dorm room, and it was not in either of their houses. Then after 
my sophomore year, after chewing tobacco and giving that up, I decided I would be the hat man. And that I would bring my growing collection of hats to college, where I hung them around the perimeter of my dorm room, never leaving the dorm, wearing the same hat more than once. Never mind that I never really looked particularly good in hats. But it was something distinctive and colorful, and eventually also discarded as I went through that phase looking for my authentic self. I narrowed in on my search. You know, we do that as we get older. I went to seminary. I was ordained. I began working in church, first as an associate, then here as your rector, and as your preacher, uh, week after week, bringing you a message from the scriptures. And like you, I am aware that there are many ways to preach a sermon. I have seen people who get very loud when they preach. I have seen people who get very excited when they preach. I have seen people bring forth the word of God with great drama and with great emotion. But that's not really me. I'm much quieter, I'm more reserved, I'm more unpredictable. I strive to be myself. I have learned that being me is the most powerful person I can be. I have learned that living into my own distinctive gifts is my sweet spot. I have learned that when I shun imitation and I pursue my own uniqueness, because like you, I have a voice of the spirit inside of me. Doesn't always tell me the green lights, but it does show me the red lights. And I'm able to kind of figure out who I am and live into myself more fully. And when I do this, things just go better. Maybe you found that out in your life that it's just easiest to be you, to quit performing, to stop trying to impress, to relax and just be yourself. And soon we discover that this is where we're closest to God. It was an ancient church father named Irenaeus who said the glory of God is the human being fully alive. The glory of God is for you to be you. And this is the theme of today's sermon. It's pretty basic, I know, but it's Father's Day and we dads sometimes need things spelled out. <laughs> be yourself. Be who you are. Discover that as ordinary as you may think of yourself, there is nothing ordinary about you. There is nothing ordinary about you. In a world begging for imitation, fashion, music, lifestyle, life choices. Make your decision based on who you are. Make choices grounded in your own personal convictions, not your peer group, not what people expect of you, but in yourself. Run your own race, not somebody else's. That still small voice inside of you that God put there is there for good reason. It's there for you to be you because we all need you to be you in order for the world to be what God wants it to be. Al, I wonder, what would a symphony be like if everybody played the violin or if everybody played the oboe? I'm sure it would sound great, but it wouldn't sound nearly as inspiring as it would with everyone playing to the best of their ability, their own unique, God-given instrument. God has given you and only you your own distinctive instrument. Don't take somebody else's. Play your own instrument to the best of your ability. Don't be afraid. Be yourself. There's nothing ordinary about you. You know, this idea comes to mind as we witness uh, Jesus calling the 12 disciples at Father Steve um, read for us. Father Steve, thanks for dressing up so much today. <laughs> It's about time to give him a break, isn't it? <laughs> Those 12 disciples, they went out and Jesus told them to take authority over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to cure every disease, to cure every sickness. Jesus has given these 12 followers a job that I've always thought was normative. Aren't I to go out and do the exact same thing? Aren't I to go out and cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, leaving behind a change of clothes, my credit cards, even a bad lunch? To do exactly what they did was their job, isn't it mine too? 
Well, like a lot of stories of the disciples, my first inclination is to think that Jesus is calling me to do the exact same thing. But I figured out that he has and he hasn't. Now, of course, there are themes of liberation and of healing and restoration and reconciliation at play here. Things that Christians of all ages and all places are to be about. The stories we hear of these disciples have certain normative themes to them. But our job isn't to be who Jesus called them to be. Our job is to be who Jesus has called us to be. Be yourself created, redeemed, and called to be a Jesus person, to be, but to be the unique God-ordained, God-anointed Jesus person that only you can be. You were born at a time in a certain family, around certain friends, in a certain community, speaking a certain language, eating certain foods that only you will ever do. And God invites us to be ourselves, for there is nothing ordinary about you. You know, many of you have passed through the parking lot, and especially this morning, and seen that wonderful 1964 Mercedes-Benz 230SL parked in the pastor's parking spot. Well, I bought that car uh, 19, and back in the 1900s, back in 1997, when I was working at a TV station in Los Angeles. And as a single person, I had the blessed opportunity to purchase a car I wanted to drive for the rest of my life. I looked at many models, I considered many possibilities before deciding on that particular car, which was owned by two lawyers in Long Beach, and I was sure I had overpaid when I handed them that check for $12,000. Well, as I pursued my call to ministry, I was studying in seminary, worked as soon after as a hospital chaplain, then I was an intern in a particularly poor parish. Well, this decision about this car started to get to me. Driving such a fancy car and being a minister, well, isn't that part of the call to serve God that you have to drive a Pinto or a Chevette or an Aspire for the rest of your life? And so I had that Mercedes packed up and I sent it to Chicago to have my best friend watch over it while I figured this out. And then I bought a 10-year-old black four-door Buick. Now there's a minister's car. <laughs> Do they make Buicks anymore? Oh, yeah, they do. Not well, sedan. I'm sorry? Not sedan. Not sedan. Well, this was roomy. It was quite a sedan. It was dependable. It was the epitome of a nondescript car, and I never once worried about somebody stealing it. <laughs> but it really wasn't that much less expensive. I mean, it used more gas. It was harder to park. I never really looked forward to driving it. And I never quite felt like it was me. I guess being from Detroit and having auto workers in my family for generations, I had always loved driving, driving a convertible through the countryside, especially, and feeling, if I may be so bold, God's presence in the wind and the warmth of the open road. And while I've, I've never been able to fully explain it, driving in that convertible had always helped me feel more like me, more connected to nature, to God. And that's the reason I called my friend up. I called him a few years later. He wasn't happy to take the call when I asked for the car back. <laughs> and I've been driving it ever since. What are the experiences you have that make you feel more authentic and connected to God? Because that's what it's about, folks, is for us to be more connected to God. Because remember, God is love, the source of love. And the more connected we are to God, the more that love flows through us. How are you trying to fit into somebody else's idea of who you should be and not your own? Because your own idea will coincide with God's idea of who we should be. How good are you at being yourself? When I was in high school, uh, my cross country team qualified for the state meets. Back then it was a three mile race. I, I guess it's probably close to that now. And we trained all year to do our best. As a runner, I had always found that I did my best. When I kind of went out with the middle of the pack. And, and, and then at the end, when other people were, were running out of gas, I always found a way to, to, to just kind of suck it up and sprint at the end and summon up all my strength and pass a lot of people towards, towards the finish line. 
Well, here we are at the state meet uh, with teams from all over Michigan, along with, with runners who I heard about I never met. There was no internet. You just see their names in the paper and their times. And, and here we are lined up, hundreds of us, for that big state meet awaiting that starting gun. And I was just overtaken with, with, with the competition, the anxiety, the excitement, the pageantry. And as that gun went off, with the speed of those leading runners. And instead of finding my pace and running my race, I decided to go out with the leaders and run their race. And I sprinted to the very front of the pack where at least at this initial point in the race, I was the fastest runner in the state of Michigan <laughs> until I wasn't. <laughs> After that first mile, I hit the proverbial wall. My lungs were hurting, my legs ached, I began to fade faster than the smoke from that starter's gun. And by the end of that race, I had not run my best race. I had run one of my worst races. I had not run my race, but somebody else's. And I have since discovered that like cross country, life is not a competition with others, not with friends, with coworkers, with siblings, with neighbors, Life is a competition with ourselves to be the best that we can be, to run our own race. Of course, I can't run like Usain Bolt. I can't preach like Bishop Bonnie. I can't sing like Jim Kenny. <laughs> but I can encourage a few people. I can inspire a few people. And I can smile. And I'm good at that. The point is, don't get distracted trying to keep up with someone with whom you're never supposed to keep up. Sure, they may have something I don't, but that's okay. I'm not running their race. I'm running mine. You're running yours. And it has a destiny all its own. So what do I do when somebody passes me? Don't I want to be in the lead in first place? Well, I've learned that the best posture that we can realize is understanding that we're not in competition with them. We're in competition with ourselves to figure out who we are and what our own unique race is about. So when other people pass you, bless them, wish them well. Don't be intimidated. Don't feel less of a person. Be happy for someone who passes you. It means that God has blessed them. And you know what? That same God will bless you. We all have a tendency to be jealous, to find fault with those who outdo us. We want to talk badly about them. We want to disparage their achievements. But we know that that's the wrong attitude. It's a trap. Be happy for them. Rejoice in the good fortune of others. Some of us like country music. And there was a famous song once written called, I thank God for unanswered prayer. Because you may be aspiring for something that isn't good for you. Run your own race, be your own person, rejoice in the good fortune of others. Thank God those 12 disciples that Jesus sent out, Jesus sent out were able to perform miracles. God has different miracles for you and for me. And this is so important because God is working inside of each one of us to create a symphony of healing, a symphony of reconciliation, a symphony of redemption that only comes about when you and I are authentically ourselves. But what if our gift, our lives, are insignificant? Well, that's what a little girl named Sudoku Sasaki once thought. She was injured by a nuclear bomb back in Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. She was two years old. She was hospitalized numerous times, which is when she learned about the legend of a thousand cranes, which is a Japanese tale that promises a wish granted to anybody who folds a thousand origami paper cranes. Well, unable to do very much in the hospital, Sasako figured she could fold paper cranes, which she did and she immediately enjoyed. Even as her condition worsened, Sudeiko continued folding those paper cranes. By the time she died, she folded 1,300 of them. 
Well, others heard about her perseverance, and they were touched. So much so that tens of thousands of paper cranes have been folded by children her age and older, and these days donated to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial in Japan, all inspired by little Sudoku and the small act of folding paper cranes. Many of us here today are going through adversity, and we have no idea how many people are watching us are witnessing to the grace, to the, 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 the ways we're going through these things without complaining, without being bitter, without being angry. And that can be a miracle in itself. None of us here know how many people we are inspiring in our pursuit of us being ourselves. <clears throat> the point is that none of us should discount our gift. It may feel small compared to others, it may feel small to ourselves, but there's nothing ordinary about you. You have the fingerprints of God all over you. Each one of us are made in God's image. Each one of us has the spark of God inside of us and the unique, irreplaceable gift and purpose of God coursing through our veins. If we were to sum up the gospel into one word, it would be hope. Because this is what the gospel gives us. We don't have to have a great gift for God to use us in a great way. And this is for God to decide, not us. We are called to do God's work, which by definition is great work. This was not easy for Sarah to understand. Thank you, Walter, for reading that lesson for us. I heard some of us chuckling as we went through that lesson, we heard about 90-year-old Sarah and her even older husband, Abraham, that she would bring forth Isaac, giving birth to Israel, to God's redemptive plan for the world. Israel, of course, is, is, uh, is birthed in, of course, Abraham, but Abraham wasn't circumcised. It was Isaac who was the very first one circumcised. But of course, Sarah thought this was ridiculous. And so she laughed. How could nations and kings of nations be inside of me, Sarah thought, at 90 years old? So she thought it was so preposterous that you remember the story a few years earlier, she heard that promise and she tried to move it along by having her husband sleep with the maid and have children that way. But God said, no, 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 Sarah. That's not what I had in mind. I have nations and kings of nations inside of you that need to come forth. And I am not going to bring forth my promise through somebody else, but through you. Friends, we are all pregnant with God's promise as well. We are pregnant with possibility. We are pregnant with destiny. We are pregnant with God's promises of security and provision and purpose. And it takes us being us, not doing things that are inauthentic like Sarah tried to do, but by patiently waiting for God to do what God promised. Having faith that we are where we're supposed to be, not trying to imitate how other runners are running the race, but knowing that God has put in us unique gifts and powers and insights for us to play our own irreplaceable roles in the redemption of the world. So friends, as we go, off, go forth this day on this Father's Day, let us give God the glory for making each of us the uniquely gifted people we are, for reminding us that we were created and set aside for priceless and incomparable work that no one else will ever be able to duplicate. Amen. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that wants to enslave us all, 
Himself was crucified, this glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and doubting, we trust in God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth and to share the common wealth of its goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful to be the church for the glory of God. Amen.
to name them silently or aloud. Uh, 
Uh, so we're going to give that to you. But first, we want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask the ladies to please stand up. And if you've got somebody that you feel comfortable laying a hand on, you may do so. If not, you may extend your hand and let us pray. God of creativity and beauty, we thank you and we praise you for the ways that you have lifted up fathers in our midst. Look gently upon fathers of newborn and young children. Give them energy, patience, and happiness in these fleeting days of long nights, diapers too numerous to count, and loading cars with strollers. Bless dads who are raising school-age children and teenagers. Dads who coach teams and stay up late helping with homework. Show them joy in the moments that seem both hard and wonderful at the same time. Bless dads who watch their adult children live their own lives. Give these fathers perspective and wisdom. Healing God, comfort all people who mourn the presence of their father today from death or illness or because of broken relationships. Comfort those who have had to, who, who had hoped to be fathers but have been unable to do so and embrace those who long to be dads. Ever-present God, hold up those fathers who mourn the loss of their own children or grieve over their broken relationships with their children. Beloved Jesus, Son of God, help us to recognize all the men who have guided us and loved us like fathers, men who send a light forth as an example of the light you shine upon all of your beloved children. Bless us and keep us today in your light. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated as I'd like to invite our uh, parish musician Al Evans forward to come and recognize our choir members for their outstanding service this past year. Thank you, Father Chris. Would any members of the choir or the bell choir please come forward? We all are blessed with many talents, but musical talents are special. They involve the body, the intellect, and the heart. And so today we recognize and thank those volunteers who are such an important part of our life here at St. David's and enrich our worship, enrich our community life in so many ways. In addition to our choir members, I would like to ask Ellen Boyce to please step forward for her invaluable and constant work, helping with the music program, helping me personally. And we're very grateful. I have a small gift for uh, each of the choir members. Well, gold bars isn't that small there, Al. <laughs> Those of you who may be watching and be members of the choir uh, will be holding on to your gift as well, unless it is indeed a gold bar and you're out of luck. <laughs> Once again, I invite the congregation to please stand and let us pray for our choir. God of creativity and beauty, we thank you for our choir, for the gifts of music, for the gifts of friendship, and for the opportunity to serve you in this wonderful space in St. David's. Lord Jesus, our teacher and guide, thank you for the opportunity to lead your people and participate fully in worship of you. Spirit of wisdom and truth, help us to embody your grace and compassion not only in our music, but also in our lives. May the music our choir makes, and we join in on, lift up all of us, and lift up all who hear it, to reflect upon your great love for us. We ask this, O Lord, through Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We invite the choir to turn around and face everybody. And uh, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Hello, Gabe.
Once again, welcome. I'm Pastor Member Mary Benson. Right after church, we invite you to join us for coffee and fellowship in our parish hall. Just head down the East Hallway after service and you'll find the parish hall. The St. David's Youth Group is going to the zoo on Tuesday. If you'd like to go, sign up on the parish website or contact the front office. And you know, I was at the zoo last week. I'm actually a member. And do you know why leopards never play hide and seek at the zoo? Why do leopards never play hide and seek at the zoo? Because they're always spotted. <laughs> <laughs> Coming June 24th, next Saturday, we're having a garage sale. If you've got enough items to fill a table in the parish hall, we want you to join us. Details can be found on the website as well. And also, we're hoping you'll join us in our summer reading project. We're reading a book called Two Dollars a Day, Living on Almost Nothing in America. It's by a University of Michigan professor and fellow Episcopalian, Dr. Luke Schaefer. As we welcome dozens of financially distressed people to our campus each week through our food pantry, we want, you to, we want to know more about the challenges of the poor. Books are $12 and are available in the narthex. We'll have a wrap-up book discussion led by Dr. Schaefer himself here in person in September. And if I could just add a personal plug, we have a representative from the Red Cross uh, out in the atrium after service today, and we're trying to have a blood drive here next Sunday. And I would encourage anybody and anybody to join, and if you can, donate blood. I myself have donated over almost nine gallons over a lifetime. And if you need somebody to come and hold your hand, if, you're, if you've never done it before, I'd be happy to come to it. But please consider donating and, and giving some information at the table up in the atrium. And finally, if you're new with us, stop at the Ministry Hub in the atrium. We want to give you a special gift and welcome you to our parish. Meanwhile, you can always keep up on the latest on our parish website. And again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. And if you want Mary to hold your hand, I think she'd do so anyway. But especially if you're going to give blood. Uh, this is, of course, our time of our uh, offertory as the ushers come forward. Uh, thank you for being so generous. Uh, it was so amazing yesterday to see 100 people on our campus. Greg, we were there. We marched down 12 Mile Road. Uh, we welcomed, uh, gosh, the judge, the commissioner, the mayor, the police chief. And this, this parish does a lot of work with the community, and it's because of your generosity. Um, so many people came up to us and thanked us for being a voice of peace at this time of a lot of fear in our nation. And you are supporting something that I think can make a real difference in our community. So thank you for being so generous. If you're online, just go uh, to our parish website, the donate button, and let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering sacrifice. Thank <laughs> Thank you. 
of your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Trinity of grace and love, we thank and praise you, for you purposed before the foundation of the world to open your dance of delight to include even us. And you shaped your very life to incorporate us in your dance forever. All our lives are subscribed by the limitations of our minds and bodies. Your life is beyond our reach and outside our imagination. While we were yet sinners, Christ not only came among us, but died at our hands. In the glory of his resurrection, he called ones like us to be his apostles and spread the good news of his mercy to all the world. And so with apostles and saints and angels and every creature in whose heart your song is sung, we join our voices in your eternal praise. <laughs>
and be not even your hearts like they with thanksgiving. Thank you. 
God of abundance, you have fed us with bread and body and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one for all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. My brothers and sisters, the Lord seeks willing laborers for the harvest. Therefore, go out into the world, proclaim the good news of the nearness of God, and call all who will hear to wholeness, to life, to holiness. And may God pour love into your hearts. May Christ Jesus open the way of grace to you, and may the Holy Spirit work through you in all things to build you up in endurance, character, and hope.